Good evening, good morning, uh, Brown Baptist. My name is Oliver Ezell, and I'm one of the Sunday School teachers at Brown Baptist. And before we get started on our lesson for today, uh, first, I'd like to open us up in a word of prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. To God, we thank you for another chance, another opportunity to come before you. And to God, we don't take it lightly, uh, the opportunity to study your word. We pray that each person that's tuning in today or uh, tonight, to God, that uh, each word that was spoken, each word that's thought about, each word that's attempted to be explained, that it will fall on good ground and you and you alone be pleased and glorified. To God, once again, we just thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for Brown Baptist, uh, our pastor, our leadership, and those who labor behind the scenes to uh, to uh, uh, propel the gospel forward. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, my name is Oliver Ezell, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we have another exciting lesson, and the title of our lesson for today is Responsibility of Those Called. Responsibility of Those Called. And this is Lesson 12 in our Sunday School book. And for those who may be following the Sunday School book, we're actually on page 82. Uh, and this is, of course, for the week of February 19, 2023. Uh, for this lesson, uh, I'm going to be using the NIV version. And we're going to be we're going to be reading from uh, the book of James, chapter two. So if, uh, I'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and turn to James, chapter two, and we'll pick up there. And once again, the title of the lesson is Responsibility of Those Called. Uh, the lesson text come James comes from James, chapter two, verses one through 12, NIV. And today we're going to talk about uh, our lesson focus. Uh, our lesson, I'm sorry, love refuses to display Favoritism, which is James chapter two, verses one through four. And then we also, we're going to talk about love, honor those whom God chooses, which is James chapter two, verses five through seven. And then we're going to talk about God's royal law. God's royal law teaches us to love one another, which is James chapter two, verses eight through 12. So that's what we're going to cover today. We have uh, quite a bit. We may not get through all of it, but we'll get through as much as we possibly can. And the time, uh, that's a lot for us. So as you open up your uh, James chapter two, uh, this lesson today, is we're going to focus on love all your neighbors as yourself. Love all your neighbors as yourself. God wants us to love, uh, love everybody. God, he loves people. And regardless of who you are or where you're from or what you look like, he wants us to love and respect all people as he does. And God does, does not want to show favoritism. And in this lesson today, we're going to talk about uh, James. And James, he was the half brother of Jesus. And as we know, Mary had other children other than Jesus. And James was the half brother of Jesus. And James, uh, he wrote this epistle early in the life of the church during a time when it was consistent, uh, when it consisted mainly of Jewish believers. Uh, there were a few Gentiles, but for the most part, the church consisted of Jewish believers uh, initially. So with James being a half brother of Jesus, he was familiar with the recipients of this letter. And, and also it suggests that they, uh, James may have one time, he may have been a part of the church in Jerusalem, uh, which he actually led. So he's actually the church he somewhat grew up in. He's now the leader of that church. Uh, they likely fled the city during persecution that arose after the stoning of Stephen. If you remember in Acts, for those who all me follow along, Bible scholars in Acts chapter, they talked about how this church scattered when uh, Stephen was uh, stoned. Uh, James, he, he also, he displayed an ongoing awareness of their struggle. He wrote to encourage them in their faith and to help them uh, discern the nature of authentic living faith in contrast to dead faith. Uh, so dead faith is just what it sounds like, it's dead. Uh, but we have a living faith because we serve a living God. And so we want to, uh, we're going to talk about that here uh, in a few minutes. So as we um, get started in this lesson, there, uh, um, uh, God, he values us through the eyes of love. God is not moved by material things or outward appearances like most people are nowadays. God looks at the heart and he treats everyone the same. God loves everyone and everyone uh, means everyone. Uh, in, this, in this lesson, James, he told his audience that they should show Christian love to all people, not just those whom the world favors, such as the rich and influential. So let's go ahead and pick up uh, our first outline. We're gonna talk about uh, love 
refuses to display favoritism, which is James chapter two, verses one through four. And I'm going to attempt to cover each verse uh, one at a time. And as I cover each verse one at a time, I will actually uh, spend a little time and just kind of talk about uh, each one of those. So as I said, we're using the NIV version. So James chapter two, verse one, the verse one reads, my brothers and sisters, believers and our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. So as we said before, James wrote this epistle and he probably wrote this epistle about 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, so just think, uh, possibly 20 years after Jesus resurrected, the believers had already fallen away from the habit of favoring people based on their status. The problem of favoring the rich over the poor appeared early in the life of the church. So showing favoritism to one over another, uh, of course, it will discourage the one that does not have the resources and the materials of the other person. So we don't want to show favoritism because it does. It, it can really damper a church, a family, a individual. Uh, so we want to treat all people not necessarily equally, but fairly. Um, verse two. Verse two says that um, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. So in verse two here, James he describing a uh, theoretical situation in which two different men receive vastly different receptions in the church worship service and it's based solely on their appearance. So the gold ring that the one man is wearing, uh, it, it marks to him, this person being a man of high social status and wealth. Uh, and of course, as we see with the person with the old clothes, uh, with, the, with the, uh, the, the poor person in filthy old clothes. And so we can see the distinguished, uh, distinguished um, characteristics of these two people James is describing in this verse. In verse three, verse three says, if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit uh, on the floor by my feet. So with this verse, verse three, we see that the rich man, he's receiving preferential treatment and it's exhibited by the opening of a place for him to, to sit comfortably. So it's kind of like a year you know, of worship service and it's kind of tight. Maybe it's at Brown, uh, first Sunday, communion's going on. Someone maybe shows a little bit late and, and you have this rich person who shows up and the ushers and everybody make every effort to sit this celebrity. Uh, maybe, it's, uh, it, it, maybe it's a sports celebrity. Maybe it's a, a, a person who's influential as far as having finances and money. And we make a special seat uh, for this person. But for the, uh, for the person that appears to look poor, we may take that person and sit them in the back, sit them in the balcony, sit them in, on the side, or even put them in one of the uh, overflow rooms because we 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 want to save those good seats for those uh, celebrities. And so, the leader of the group he directs in in this in this uh, verse the leader of the group he's directing this poor man, uh, and perhaps he was a beggar. And it's based, like I said, on, on that's based on looking at his clothes. And he's, he's telling this poor looking man, okay, stand in the back or sit on the floor. Okay, let's move on. And verse four, verse four says, have you not discriminated among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? So with this verse, what James is saying, he's saying, rather than offer him assistance and find a place to sit as he did with the wealthy person, He's treating the poor man with disdain and also disrespect. Such discrimination like this, it revealed two basic sins, uh, that of a divided allegiance and of evil thoughts and motives. So this, so the people who are doing this, back in James' time, James said, you have evil, either you have an evil thought or an evil motive for doing this. And so the culture of the first century AD, it exhibited uh, considerable prejudice based on social class, it, it, uh, uh, what what social uh, what ethnically uh, you come from, how wealthy you are, uh, your nationality, or even uh, your religious background, whether you were Jew, Gentile, Sumerian, uh, whatever the case may be, everything was looked at, and you was judged upon for that back in the first century. Uh, I don't want to those type things that happen now here in uh, 2023. But anyway, uh, in the New Testament, we see these divisions most often. Uh, it happens with the Jews versus the Samaritans 
or in the attitude of the Jews towards early Gentiles. So we have Jews versus Gent Jews versus Samaritans because we know Samaritans were um, half Jew, half uh, Gentile, and then of course we got the just flat out Jews versus Gentile believers. And so we see that we see a difference that's taking place between the two groups, and also. Um, the unity of the early church, it shocked the world at that time, and it demonstrated the love Jesus commanded of his disciples. The early church was extremely unified. They were extremely focused. It was all on one accord. Early church at the beginning, when Jesus uh, first uh, was there on the scene, and of course, when he ascended, the church was real close. They were sharing. But like I said, within 20 years after that, the church is kind of splintered. And so we see here in this verse, it's talking about the favoritism showed to the rich in the early church. It not only displays disobedience to Jesus' most basic instruction, but also failed to uh, differentiate uh, them from the pagan world. So here we now we have the early church looking just like the pagan world and how they're showing favoritism towards one another. And we know, of course, uh, that's not what our Lord and Savior taught. Let's move on. Uh, so let's look at the next outline. It's going to talk about love honors those whom God chooses. And that's going to come from James chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. And once again, we're using the NIV version. So verse 5 says, uh, listen, my brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to, and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? So with this, what verse 5 is saying at this time, the church consisted of mostly from the poor class of people, uh, since they since they were more ready to uh, ready to respond to the gospel. But for some reason, we see that even nowadays, a lot of times, the people who are uh, less fortunate, the poor class, they are more ready, more open to receive the gospel. And so, what James is saying in verse five, he's saying uh, he said, but but do. Uh, He's he's not saying uh, uh, he, he's what well, James is not saying. He's not saying that uh, God shows favoritism uh, for the poor over the rich, or that the rich cannot come uh, come to faith in Jesus. He's not saying that. He's not saying God loves rich over the poor and poor over the rich. He's that's not what he's saying. He's saying that poverty by itself does not earn one's merit in God's eyes. So just because you are poor, that doesn't mean you have a free ticket into heaven, and vice versa. Uh, the poor, however, as we said, they are more readily, readily to accept the good news of salvation. The rich, a lot of times, they're more reluctant to put their trust in the Savior because their wealth is standing away. Uh, we all know we've heard that verse in the Bible that says it's easier for an eye, a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter to heaven because rich people, well off people, have a tendency to base their life and base um, all the things they have in their in their future on their money, their wealth. So sometimes it can be kind of it's kind of hard uh, uh, to uh, trust in a God you don't see when you have all this money, thousands, and millions of dollars sitting in the bank. Or why do you need God if you got money? That's what maybe that's what they're thinking. I don't know. Uh, also, it's much easier for the poor to recognize their spiritual. Uh, 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 and poverty as far as uh, as far as their property, uh, 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 what I'm trying to say is uh, uh, they're uh, being impoverished uh, than those who are highly, highly educated. So when you're living in poverty, uh, and, and, and of course you may not have the degree that you think you need to have or, or you can't afford, uh, a lot of times the Poor people look down on that for being living in, in a poverty state, uh, and but of course the rich and those who are or have a lot of money, a lot of times the world considers them to be wise. Not always, but the world a lot of times considers them to be wise. And uh, years ago, I read an article. It said that uh, for the most part, poor people uh, contributed significantly more to charities and churches uh, than rich people. And a matter of fact, the article, I, I forget the mistake, the article went on to say people living in Mississippi and places like that, proportionally, they gave more to the poor uh, than rich people did. So why is that? Why would why do you think rich people uh, would give less than poor people? My my opinion is that I forgot, I, forgot, I can't uh, put all the facts of the article together, but, but people that are poor, they can relate and they can sympathize, uh, sympathize, sympathize 
with those people who are poor because they've been there. They know what it's like. They know what it feels like. Uh, they know what it feels like to have nothing or to have little. Uh, so scripture tells us that we bring nothing of merit to the Lord and our saving faith and our, our, our receipt of eternal life comes totally from God's grace and mercy so, so that no one can boast. So no one can boast. No one can pay for it. It's a gift. It's a gift that God gives us. Okay. Uh, and for verse six, verse six says, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? So here with this verse in verse six, James, he's saying uh, the rich visitor represented a class of people that had opposed early believers with a variety of lawsuits. And that's how a lot of the rich people got richer by suing and using the legal system to take uh, from the middle class or the poor people. And so they were they knew how to exploit the laws through uh, lawsuits and, and to gain even more wealth. And so here, James, he reminded his readers of the necessity to love those whom God has chosen to be part of his kingdom and co-heirs with them of, for eternal life. So that's, that's what James reminded them. To, uh, so we're, so we're, not, we're not supposed to just drag people into court uh, uh, dishonestly just so we can line our pockets with more exploiting. Uh, that's a huge sin, and God's not pleased with that. Verse 7. Verse 7 says, are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? So with verse seven, it said uh, it, that it, it didn't make sense uh, to uh, to show favor for the rich over the poor because they were the ones that ex exported the believers in the law in the law courts. And they also they blasphemed the precious name of Jesus Christ. So moving on, um, we're going to go over to the uh, third outline. Uh, the third topic, and it's going to talk about God's law. I'm sorry, God's royal law teaches us to love. God's royal law teaches us to love. And that's James chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. And verse 8 says, uh, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbors as yourself, you are doing right. So James begin this section, this section by assuming that his readers uh, might defend their treatment of the rich on the basis of the command to love your neighbor as yourself. So James, he's doing, he's anticipating what the readers are going to think about verse number eight. He's in uh, and, and, and the verses prior to that. He's anticipating what they're going to say. And he says, some of them may justify, well, the scripture says to love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm just taking care of myself. Uh, so, and, and of course, you know, by doing, by the rich doing that, basically taking that, thought of that verse or that command from Jesus out of contact when it says, love your neighbors as yourself. But the issue was not the treating of the wealthy man with respect. Of course, yes, you treat the wealthy man, anybody, you treat all people with respect. But the problem was they were treating the poor person with contempt. And such behavior that breaks this command since both are just, uh, just as much as neighbors as the other. Also, uh, the reference to the law as royal that depicts is something of regal character, a command worthy of high status. So this may also that, that uh, uh, allusion to royal. This may re, uh, refer to the lofty character, or perhaps those that are keeping it. Uh, they're keeping it, demonstrating their allegiance to Jesus, who of course was our King. So Jesus, when it talks about royalty, is the, uh, the ultimate royalty, it's the ultimate royal, and that would be our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our King. Uh, verse nine. Verse nine says, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. So the issue here with verse nine, it says, uh, however, uh, it was not that the treating that the rich man, uh, the treating the rich man with kindness, but it was of honoring him above the poor man who wanted into the same church, uh, church service. So, yes, but once again, you treat the rich man with kindness. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but at the same time. You have to treat poor people who work, who wander into church with the same love and kindness you would show those celebrities. Verse 10. Verse 10 says, for whoever keeps the, the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking of it all. So verse 10 is saying, if you break just one of God's command, 
it makes us a lawbreaker in God's eye and it's in, in, you, in your need of redemption. So the failure of these readers to show love to the less fortunate demonstrate the same sinful ten tendencies as found in those who break the royal law of loving others as yourselves. If you notice, most of the time the world, the word sin, most of the time in the Bible, the word sin is spelled without an S at the end. It's just uh, the singular. Uh, sin is sin. And so a lot of times you, you, of course, it's both ways, but for the most part, you often see the world sin without an S because sin is sin. Uh, no sin, one sin is just as great as the other. They're all the same. Sin is the sin. Granted, God is looking at them in a different light, but sin is sin. Uh, so if possession of eternal life is dependent upon keeping the law, no one could ever obtain it. It depends. It, it depends solely on Jesus Christ. So, just because you know you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, that does not give you the right to go out and commit sin, any sin you choose. Then have the mindset that well, it's okay because God is going to forgive me anyway. You can't do that. You can't say that. Well, I know I'm saved, so I can I can do anything I want to because God's going to save me anyway. Uh, so that's wrong. And so absolute, absolute freedom from the guilt of sin does not lead to a license to sin. As a matter of fact, it should motivate, motivate us to live for the one who gave his life for us. So we may show that the same mercy to others regardless of the status. And verse 11 says, verse 11 says, for he, for, 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 it says, for he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. So once again, unless you are 100% never sin, you've never done anything wrong in your life, then you're good. But we can't find anybody like that. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So therefore, all of us need redemption of that lawbreaker. Uh, each one of us, no matter what, we need uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to pick us up because all, uh, none of us, whether it be something big or something small, uh, we all need Jesus Christ and we all are sinners. Verse 12 says, uh, verse 12 says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. So if we if we fail to show mercy to the to the lowly and the people hurting around us, Jesus will use that same standard and evaluate our service and faithful to him. So if we want mercy, we need to show mercy. If we want a friend, we have to be friendly. So the same pattern that we use and we uh, you uh, and, and and connect with other people. Jesus take that and He use the same on us. On us. So that's the reason why we need to uh, be careful how we treat people. It's just like the stock market or four hundred one k. You reap what you sow, and so those same principles applies to everything we do. So, so for lesson today, so self love and appreciation are very important in order for us to love someone else. Uh, you can only give what you have. So if you're empty, so if you if your vessel is empty then how can you pour into someone else? And that's what our lesson for today is about. So once again, thank you for joining us today. Once again, this title lesson is Responsibility of Those Called. And our lesson focus is love all your neighbors as yourself. And if at any time you'd like to connect with any of the teachers at Brown Baptist, feel free to reach out to our Sunday school superintendent, Deacon Marcus Robinson or Ms. Gloria Cage. Uh, they would love to connect you with myself or any other teacher at Brown. And we pray that you all have a, a blessed and amazing week. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for a chance to study your word. We pray to God that each word today, once again, it will follow good grounds and you, and you alone be pleased and glorified. We thank you, love you in Jesus' name. Amen.